want you all to close your eyes. And keep them close. Now imagine that you're in a vast forest. You're at the base of a large tree. You look up. You see branches rustling in the canopy. You look a little closer. You see creatures with ten legs or three hearts, beaks, suckers, fluorescent colours, and some have just one foot. More than 500 animals cling to the tree's swaying branches, but they don't weigh it down. Why? Because the forest that you are in is underwater. No open your eyes. We all know the oceans unify us. They give us a sense of identity, a place to reflect and meet up with the ones that we love. But if you take a dive below the surface, you'll find that our coasts are lined by vast underwater forests created by large brown seaweeds. These are the food and home for multitudes of animals, like crusty cloud crabs or glistening fish. These are places that give us a sense of wonder for a world far larger than the one we know. Ever since I can remember, I've been inspired by their deaths. But these aren't places that just capture our imaginations. They capture carbon and produce oxygen in return. They give us fish, one of our main sources of food. They shield us from severe weather like flooding and storms and they help to regulate our climate. So these are clearly places that we need for our own survival too. But around the world, underwater forests are disappearing. And not just in far off places, but right here in our backyard. And because they're hidden below the surface, out of sight, out of mind, the disappearance of our underwater forests has largely gone by unnoticed. And we're not just losing these habitats, but all of the benefits that they provide us as well. Now I want you to imagine if we could have a future where we could have vast underwater forests once more. Today, I want to show you how we're currently redefining the way that we manage our underwater ecosystems so that we can make this happen. Now, as someone who grew up around the coast of Sydney and as a marine biologist, I've always been very concerned about the way that we manage our natural environment. And if you think about how we usually do this and talk about it, call it conservation. But what does the word conserve really mean? It means to keep what we have, to make it stay the same. And obviously this isn't working because increasingly our marine habitats don't look like we imagine. They actually look like this. Now this is because our footprint around the world is now so large. We've come to a point where conservation is clearly not enough. It's time to intervene. We have to restore our ecosystem in order to be able to conserve them at all. So scientists are starting to work on this problem, but we're also starting to ask ourselves a new question. Is restoring environments as they once were even enough? And the reason for this is because our planet is now changing faster than ever before. And the reality is, it's not going to stop anytime soon. Even if we cut our effects and curb our carbon dioxide emissions, which we clearly need to do, you all know this. We can still look ahead to several decades of impacts such as ocean warming. So increasingly, scientists are having to anticipate these changes in the ecosystem and predict what will survive so that we can restore these ecosystems and we won't watch them disappear once again. Now I want to take you for a dive into the underwater world where I work here in Sydney. This is crayweed. This is the dominant canopy forming seaweed on the East Australian coast. As you can see, it's bushy, it grows to three metres tall, and it's the main habitat for unique community families that can't be supported by any other seaweeds. Actually, Crayweed got its name because it's the main habitat for abalone and crayfish, or rock lobster, so they're our two most commercially important fisheries in Australia. But, Crayweed, and all its benefits, disappeared from Sydney almost 40 years ago. So a little while back, I joined a team of scientists who call ourselves Operation Crayweed, and it's our mission to bring crayweed back. 
Now we do this by drilling into the rocks under the waves and transplanting healthy crayweed onto mats. It's a bit like underwater gardening, but it's not as easy as it sounds. Definitely not. But this has been immensely successful. We found that not only does our crayweed survive, it has seaweed sex and babies, or crayweeds, as I like to call them. And we've now seen we have cravings popping up, not just over the mats, but spreading out along our coasts as well. And with the first craving forests reappearing after almost 40 years, we've seen many of the animals associated with these habitats coming back as well. So this is a really good news story for the environment, but it does make you ask, how are we ensuring that they're going to be surviving in this changing world? One of the most fundamental ways that we're doing this is ensuring that our populations that we restore are genetically diverse. Let me show you why. Imagine that these green dots are a seaweed population that we've just restored. They're all genetically similar, so they react in similar ways to their environment. Now let's just say something new comes in, say a stress of life, a marine heat wave. If they're susceptible to it, you risk losing the entire population. But if you restore a genetically diverse population and the same stressor comes in, you have a high chance of having individuals that may cope and survive to adapt into the future. So I've been applying these concepts to our restoration here in Sydney. I've been looking at the genetic diversity of natural prairie populations that we source from, and I found several genetic groups. So we use this to create a mixture of genetically diverse individuals that we put back on Sydney's reefs. And this isn't just some abstract concept that scientists talk about. You can see it in the real world as well. So what's really exciting about this research is that we found that the next generation, the Cravies, are just as genetically diverse as their parents that we originally planted. Which is great because we're giving them the best chance of surviving, not only now, but into a much new world. But our work hasn't stopped there, it's still ongoing. So we're also at the point where we can look at specific genes and see how they contribute to an individual's tolerance to different stresses. So thinking about global warming, I've been scanning populations further north to see if we can identify individuals that might already be adapted to warmer environments. So that one day, perhaps we can include them in this mixture as well. Now, my work with Prairie is just a small example of how scientists around the world are having to increasingly think ahead. And actually, many of these concepts are starting to be used across different ecosystems to save them, like coral reefs as well. But there are, of course, natural boundaries as to how much environments can tolerate change, and our world is changing fast. So while it's up to all of us to reduce our impacts, it's our younger generations that are going to be creating these novel solutions that bring us into the world that we want. Imagine what that 